talking about it. It's a good story. So <laughs> it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute after the show today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate uh, the interest too. Ab absolutely. And before we get into your life and your work, I want to begin with another calamity. We're getting on the four year anniversary of this pandemic. How did you survive it and how did it subsequently change you? Yeah. I mean, the pandemic was such a life-changing moment for, I think, many people, if not all people. Um, I was the head of IT at Etsy at the time, and that means that I was responsible for all of the internal technology systems data um, for the company. So making sure that the employees could still uh, run the business and the platform of, of Etsy. Yeah. And... <clears throat> When the pandemic first started, I was in Dublin. Um, we had gone for a leadership planning exercise. And so I flew back uh, mid-March, early March, and we immediately convened a crisis management team. Um, we worked, and this was a cross-functional crisis management team, right? So it was, how do we collectively make sure that the business can uh, understand what's happening and do the right thing for our employees, for our community, for our buyers, for our sellers. Now, I'm not at Etsy anymore, I should say. Um, uh, I left a couple of months ago. I'm on my own now doing uh, leadership coaching, which is super exciting. It's been a 20-year journey to get here, and I'm so excited to be at this space. But sure. um but this was like what the pandemic was for me. It was this experience of um, trying to really intentionally and thoughtfully manage the unknown and the chaos of what was going on by breaking all of those things down into smaller, more knowable variables that we could start to address. And really, that's what happened through the next couple of years was, yeah. okay, what, what do we know? Not a lot at first, but then we started to know a little bit more. And by moving like slowly forward, where there was a lot of uncertainty and quickly forward, where we knew things, we were able to maneuver pretty well. I think Etsy made it through the pandemic pretty successfully. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, you know the the call for masks was not a uh, <laughs> not a bad thing yeah. um, for the business, but yeah, it was a lot of so that's what my pandemic was. Yeah, it was how do I turn uncertainty and chaos into either complicated and maybe a little unknowable, but still semi familiar or known variables that we could kind of move forward. I, I got to tell you, along with this, I I am an IT guy. I, I work in a school district by day, and I've been in IT for years. I got, you know, I was a part of that whole 90s thing where I started doing desktop publishing, and they're like, hey, can you do this too because we're cheapskates? It's like, sure, let's go. And, you know, it was before <laughs> certifications where it was based on, rich people needing to save more money. So I learned by proxy, but I understand that time period too, because I think it was all about how are we, I mean, it was a different architecture based on Etsy and what you do in a school district, but it's still going into this realm of how are we going to dispatch these devices home? How are we going to ensure that they're going to have connectivity, especially in areas where you know, they, they may not have Wi-Fi at home. There's just all those variables you got to. Yeah. So yeah. many variables. Yeah. And it was, again, that, that goes to the, the unknown, right? You have thousands of employees in a school district. I would imagine you're dealing with, you know, a similar kind of a scale with all the kids and all of the administrators and all of the teachers. Right. Yeah. And what is the baseline that's kind of the same for everyone? And then how do you create kind of options and tiers that can fit most people? Yeah. And then that gives you the space once you've kind of mapped that out to then take the time to help those edge cases for folks who like, actually I went into an office because I don't have internet service yeah. where I live. And so how do we maybe send them a MiFi to use or something right. else? 
Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of mapping, let's let's map something out here. I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders. It's career day. And one of the kids says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? Yeah, I say um, I help people to be successful. Um, I help people figure out what they should be doing. Um, I help them understand and realize how they can do those things. And then I help them to make sure that the conditions around all of this are as favorable as possible within their kind of locus of control, maybe a little high level for a third grader there, but <laughs> within sure. what you can manage yourself, right? What you're responsible for Yeah. Um, in order to be successful. So what did you want to be in the third grade? What was your dream? I wanted to be a veterinarian. Like okay. I think a lot of kids probably at that age yeah, I'm a big animal lover. We've got three cats and two dogs, so. Okay. Yeah, I get it. I got a lot of animals at home. So let me ask you this. How did IT become your focus? How did you get into technology? Take me back to where you're born and raised and how these seeds that eventually got into technology and then got into leadership coaching. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I was that kind of kid that took everything apart to figure out how to put it back together again. I was just naturally curious. And I think I had a fearlessness that I I still have. Um, uh, although I do think the older you get, sometimes that fearlessness starts to wane a bit and you have to be more intentional about it instead yeah. of the kid like I'm made out of rubber and I can bounce off of the ground if I drop two stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I kind of naturally was exploratory in a lot of things. Um, I played a lot of video games. I'm still a big console gamer. Uh, and so there's, um, there was emergent technology that was happening there. Um, I grew up, I think I was in my, um, teenage years when MTV first kind of started um, to give you a time frame without giving too much of a time yeah. frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A solid Gen Xer. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's the, the basis of it, right? Curiosity and openness. And then fast forward to I graduated from high school. I didn't really want to go to college. It wasn't my thing. I played um, a bass in a bunch of like punk rock bands in D.C., um, it, it moved out to LA, played in some like um, pop punk bands, got a, a couple of jobs as a waitress and a bartender. Like I had a very non-traditional path, but I was always about helping people and supporting people. That was always in there with the curiosity. And then after a while, I realized that I probably needed health insurance. And this was well before the days of health insurance is available for everyone. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to have to get a corporate gig. And so I went and I started stuffing envelopes because I thought this doesn't require a college degree or any type of training. And from there, I, I just kind of moved into these part-time roles where I eventually got hired. And I got hired as a manufacturing assistant at a record company out in LA, Priority Records, Gangster Rap Labels. Yeah. So much fun. Yeah. And worked there um, doing manufacturing, making sure that the CD booklets um, and you know uh, cassette um, covers and things were stocked in our warehouse, I think kind of near Kansas City. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it's in your hood, actually. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And then one day I was fixing an electric stapler at my desk and the head of IT walked by and he said, I want you to come work for me. And two years of his tutelage on the job, he taught me everything from building a, um, a machine from the motherboard up and how all of those components work together. He taught me about how to do help desk, how to do software support, how to build and manage networks. Um, this was back in the days where uh, business continuity and disaster recovery involved a stack of disks this big to bring a server back up, right? Yep, yep. And so we, we learned that. I mean, he taught me all of that. I was managing our data center. Uh, and then EMI Music bought us. I'm yeah. giving you the really long story. I no, this is good. I like it. <laughs> okay. And uh, EMI bought us, and I moved into Deside Support. This was where the space was for me in in that in that place. 
and loved it. Again, it was helping people. It was helping them understand something that was confusing and sometimes scary to them and helping them feel confident in that space, which is really what my, my leadership coaching is about too, taking someone who's feeling overwhelmed and helping them feel confident instead. And that was the beginning. From there, years of uh, that moved me into management. Um, it was not a conscious decision, which is another lesson I try to help people about. Like, you don't have to move into management to, you know, increase your career. You can stay an individual technical contributor. Um, became director of um, global infrastructure. Universal Music bought us. Uh, worked on the, some mergers and acquisitions and divestments in that space, left, went to Spotify for three years as their head of IT, um, a lot of international travel, really helped through the hyper growth phase of Spotify, which was a fantastic opportunity to learn and grow with amazing, smart, talented people. Yeah. And then from there, moved to Etsy um, and was there for five years as their head of IT. Wow, that's fascinating. So you were on the cusp of this whole wave of what we're going through with music right now. I mean, that's, that was the beginning. I watched that. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that transition from, you know, cassettes and LPs yeah. to digital and LPs yeah. <laughs> where we are today. Well, that's the weird thing about it is that we went from floppy disks or the big, huge, like literally floppy disks yep. all the way now to everything in the cloud. Same thing with music. We went from, you know, maybe I'm a tracks predates me, but it's still part of, you know, what I see in thrift stores all the time. And yep. then now there's an accessibility to music because so you went from Napster to Spotify and then, you know, where we're at right now. So it's weird, you know, and I have a jazz radio show and a lot of those musicians still put out CDs. It's yeah. like their their calling card. And I still listen to CDs. I love it. I, I mean, I yeah. still have that that joy of like cracking it open, putting it in. And, and it's great. I love it. So yeah, it's cool. yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything old is new again, yeah. first of all. It's retro. Secondly, you know, these are still viable methods for sharing music and yeah. you can own it. You don't have to, you know, worry about some third party who owns your access to these things. Totally. Too. That's the other thing. I'm so glad you said that because in this modern era, it's so nice to feel like you're not a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> it's just but i remember this is the other weird thing about the psychology of digital media when monty python released their whole digital library on amazon they were giving out some of it free and they sold more than ever and yeah. it was that whole idea of lars ehrlich freaking out like this multi multi near billionaire guy is losing his mind about everybody not paying him for his music yeah. but then you got monty python and these cats that are like hey you can have this yeah. And then they want to buy more. It's like, yeah. just play the game correctly and yeah. don't treat people like the crooks. And it's going to make everything that much easier. Yeah. I, I remember that time period when the music companies were treating their customers like criminals, yeah. like they didn't trust them. And, and I remember having conversations with some of the new media is what we called that area of digital at the time. Um, I remember having conversations with the leaders in those areas and saying, you know, it's you're wasting money and you're alienating people. You have to trust people. Yep. And X amount of people are going to do what they're going to do. And those people are going to break any types of, um, of digital protection that we're going to put on there anyway and release it in a bunch of spaces. Yeah. So you can continue to treat our customers as criminals or you can show them the value of why it makes sense to purchase. Yep. You know, maybe when you buy an album, you also get some type of um, a coupon for a, a good coupon yep. for um, merchandise at the next show, right? Yep. Like, how do you work with the musicians, with the artists and the creatives and the customers to create real value yep. to bring forward instead of punitively, you know, trying to hoard and limit everything? And what you did there with your fingers was a half circle and it's a smile. So all of that would make sense, right? <laughs> yes. I so let it. me let me ask you this. Who's been a hero for you in your life? Mm, that's a really great question. Who has been a hero for me? You know, that 
that boss that I told you about, the head of yeah. IT who saw me fixing that stapler, who saw me. And I, I want to kind of say that part again. I think that was one of the first times I got, I felt really seen uh, for the value I could bring as an employee. I've been seen in my life as a human, but not necessarily in a work environment like that. And, and the time that he spent to teach me, Jim Earl was his name. I'll never forget Jim. He was just such a hero to me. The, the way that he approached things, you know, the, some of the things we were just talking about with trust and empowerment and, you know, how do you collaboratively work with others to create a positive environment where it's win-win for everyone instead of this negative kind of do what I say because I'm saying it. Yep. Um, he's the one that really helped shape that mentality in me that like build a collaborative trusting environment, show people the way, explain why, yep. you know, feed into their motivations, um, build something of value together and see them for what they're bringing. And it's, you know, every, every and, and the people who want that will come and, and, and work with you in those ways. So I, I, Jim Earl, I, my hero. Yeah. You know, my, the guy that hired me, my IT director in this district, his name was Randy. And I remember I, I walked into the room to interview and there was like 15, 16 people. I didn't expect it. Wow. And it was like, whoa. And That's daunting. Yeah. And he's all the way across the, the, the room and his whole criterion for hiring people was I want he they need to have a good attitude and a willingness to learn. Those were his two main criteria. And from there, he could do whatever he can mold anybody into it. And he was the same way. Everybody loved him. He was effective. He was good. He showed people and he he, in, he instilled that idea of showing people how to do it and then giving them the reins to be autonomous to get it done. And then that yeah. just leads to more learning. That leads to being a more effective technician. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's wild. So let me ask you this. Of all the people that are on the planet right now, <laughs> who's the most fascinating to you? Who would you love to meet and talk to? Oh, that's a great question. Oh, that is a great question. Hmm. It, it can be the stumper sometimes. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a stumper. Um, okay, so I've been doing ceramics and pottery yeah. lately. Um, it's something that I got into a year or so ago, um, but with um, real passion in the last few months, actually. And there is a potter that I absolutely adore. His name's Florian Gadsby. He's based in the UK. He is brilliant. He's an, a consummate artist at heart. Um, his work is just spectacular. He's also a bit of a social media sensation. So the way that he, as a kind of a modest introvert approaches marketing and self-promotion in this way that you don't expect because he doesn't come at it in the way so many people do has just been kind of really eye-opening for me um because that's uncomfortable for me too and so finding ways to do it that feels authentic is and watching him has just been amazing so he was on um the great pottery throwdown, which I'm watching uh, streaming right now. Sure. And he was a guest just the, the other day. Well, I mean, this is now past, but I watched it just the other sure. day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I had like a, a fan moment where I was like, oh my gosh, he's, <laughs> oh, which is so funny because I don't have those moments very often. And yeah. so it was really neat to see that and to kind of recognize that awe of, the beauty that someone can bring just in being their their true authentic self and sharing their talents and their um uh their knowledge with yeah. folks really well fantastic. said yeah those those people are intriguing let me ask you this in your new venture of being a coach what's been your best success story so far mm, that's a good question too hmm. You know, I've been 
working with someone and i um i take confidentiality super Absolutely. seriously Absolutely. so i'll be vague here sure. in this um but i've been working with someone who was relatively new in their career and um was just part of a layoff and needed to think about how to transition into what's going to come next and that's scary right now tech companies are laying people off at a incredible rate i think there were a lot of questionable business decisions and um, leaders uh, are, um, uh, in my opinion, taking the easy way out and just doing kind of um, massive layoffs. And um, this person was able to recognize what their values were, what really mattered to them, what companies they might want to work at, why that mattered. And, and that helped them go from, again, that kind of overwhelmed state to, I know what my non-negotiables are. I know where I can flex and be comfortable. And I feel like I have a really good path forward with confidence to interview and find what the next role is going to be for me. And that felt pretty special. Yeah. So of all of the things that you've done in your career, what are you the proudest of? Hmm. You know, I think it was getting Etsy through the pandemic. Yeah. Um, truly, uh, it wasn't just helping people get connected early on. It was years of how do we work together remotely? What does the future of work need to look like? What does collaboration look like? How do we do decision making? How do we make connections? How do we onboard new people into the company when we can't do this in person physically? How do we help them build relationships and gain the context that we that they need to be successful? And then once we moved back to hybrid, all of that had to be refactored again yeah. because then some people were in person and some people weren't and reworking all of that again. It was, I think, the most challenging and the most rewarding um, uh, time in my career. So what's the best advice you've ever gotten? Mm. The best advice I've ever gotten is it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. It matters what, what, what matters to you is what matters to what you're going to do. You don't have to follow the crowd and do what all of the other people are, are saying is the right way forward. You need to figure out what's going to work for you because ultimately it's your journey. It's your life. They're your decisions. You're going to live with the repercussions of those. And so it really needs to be special to you um, how you move forward in your life, whether it's what job you're going to take or the approach you're going to take to those things or the decisions you're going to make or the relationships that you're going to have in your life, all of it. So as a music fan, what was the first live show you saw that blew you away? Uh, <laughs> the, the first live show I ever went to was Oingo Boingo. Um, wow. They, they, they're fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. And the first one that ever blew me away, you know, I went with my mom to Wolf Trap uh, to see the Everly Brothers when I was in high school. Yeah. Um, and and it was spectacular. I wasn't yeah. a huge Everly Brothers fan, you know, and I was in high school and I was going with my mom to a concert, yeah. but it's this outdoor venue, beautiful nature, the stars, and it was just so much fun. Fun. And yeah. she had such a great time and it was such a wonderful like moment to share. Yeah. Yeah. Loved it. That's a great memory. So at the end of the day, everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Hmm. I like to think that I'm a helper. I like to think that I'm here to... Um, leave things a little better than I found them. Yeah. And um, I, I follow my own advice or I follow that advice that I got that now I give to others. <laughs> so I'm paying it forward of 
you know, living my own authentic life. And um, that means being brave, even when it's scary. And it means um, giving when I have something extra to give and maybe even when I don't um, uh, in order to make the world a better place. Yeah. Well said. So if anyone wants to hire you, learn more about you, reach out, what's the good business? Yeah. So my coaching website is seancarneycoaching.com. Uh, and that's S-H-A-W-N-C-A-R-N-E-Y. And if you're interested in looking at my pottery, you can go to etsy.com slash shop slash Sean Carney art. I was actually going to ask you what's the best thing on Etsy, and now I know. So yeah, I oh yeah, it. for sure. My <laughs> I make these little kitty cat smoker houses that you put over an incense cone, and the smoke comes oh. out of their mouth. Super cool. Oh yeah, I have. We have cats. I mean, I didn't realize until I got older that I'm a big cat fan. <laughs> yeah. um, so we just see eye to eye. It works. In fact. Yeah. Half the time when I'm doing Zoom calls, all of a sudden I'll see a tail and I'm like, oh, yeah. what's going I'm on? Surprised. Here's my voice and we, we're, we're fraternizing. It's good. So, <laughs> Sean, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for your story, for your time. Yeah. Best of luck with the business. I appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. I really appreciate your time too. You bet. Thank you. Take care.